to our webinar on working with kids with CVI. We're really excited you could be here. We want to encourage you to check out other webinars that we have. We have them constantly. Um, and I'm going to post a link in the, in the chat that will let you know where to look at all the other opportunities. Um, there it is, okay. Um, and I wanna let you know that our next session is gonna be on April 1st and it's working with blind and low vision students with autism. Um, so hopefully you can join us for that one. It's all in the link on the GI portal. Um, and our videos are going to be recorded and we're gonna post them to YouTube afterwards. Um, so you can share them with your colleagues and the people who aren't able to be on the call can still join in. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Paige. Paige Bradford is a doctoral candidate at the George Washington University. She's per her, pursuing her doctorate in special education. Paige's work focuses on the inclusion of people with complex learning needs. She currently works as a special education teacher for the Arlington Public Schools and she has a background in deaf blindness and cortical visual impairment. Um, so we're really excited to have you, Paige. I want to encourage everybody to um, type their questions as Paige goes along in the chat feature. If you go down um, on the bottom, you can kind of type anything in there. And I will let Paige know um, as she goes along with her presentation any questions that come up. So feel free to ask questions um, and really kind of make this what works best for you. So I will hand it over to Paige. Go ahead, Paige. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen with you and go to the PowerPoint, and then we'll just get started and go from there. Okay. Sorry, I have a dog. Um, so I'm here to talk about cortical visual impairment, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what it is, and then we'll also talk about some interventions. Um, some things that are practical strategies that you can use in your schools. So like Conchita said, just a little bit about me. Um, I live in Alexandria um, with my dog, who you've already heard. And um, I'm a special education teacher, but I've kind of um, worked around in different counties, um, always with students with really complex medical needs and um, really complex disabilities. And I'm currently doing a lot of research on how to include those students in the general education classroom. Mm -hmm. So kind of what we're going to do today, um, we'll talk about CVI, an overview, the characteristics and phases of CVI, and then um, different classroom adaptations, so instructional strategies and accommodations and modifications that you can provide to your students. And we'll definitely have time for questions at the end, but if you have questions throughout, please feel free to ask. Um, so I just wanted to start with like some fast facts, because I think um, people are not always as aware of CVI and kind of um, how it impacts students currently. So it's actually the most common cause of visual impairment in children in developed countries. And so what we're finding is that we have a lot of students who are born um, and they might have varying disabilities, but they'll be 10, 11, 12 years old before they're diagnosed with CVI. And so they've lost a lot of years of learning how to use their vision. Uh, a child with CVI can also have perfect visual acuity which is really makes it more difficult to diagnose, but it also makes it seem as though the child may not have a, a, a vision deficit and it could be something else. And the other thing that I think is important to know is that the functional vision of a student with CVI can change depending on those environmental and internal factors. Um, so one day you might have a student who is in phase three, who's able to see text and, and um, who's able to read and see pictures, but then maybe they're tired or something else has happened and they're not able to see that text. So it's, it, it's very fluid. And our knowledge of CVI is increasing every year, but a lot of TVIs and professionals in the field of special education have never heard of CVI. So there are a number of students who I've met um, who I've said, oh, you know, it seems like there might be something going on with their vision and they'll end up, um, having a functional vision assessment and it'll, it, you know, well, the outcome will be that they have CVI. So kind of to frame our thinking today, um, I think we should just be aware of the fact that CVI is, is increasing. We're, we're diagnosing more students with it, um, but there are probably a lot of students who are in our schools who are not diagnosed. 
And so I included this graphic um, that one of my friends posted on Facebook. And so I feel like it accurately describes kind of CBI and, and, and research and what's going on. So it says in 2009, nobody has ever heard of cortical visual impairment. 2019, nobody has ever heard of cortical visual impairment. So often people will ask a lot of questions about it to me, you know, well, what is it? I've never heard of that. So just keeping that in mind as we go through. So CVI is um, defined as a condition in which children have reduced visual acuity as a result of damage to the posterior visual pathways. Um, and like I said, in most cases, the, there are, the eyes are structurally normal, but there's diminished visual capacity or functional, functional vision. Um, and most children with CVI typically appear blind, but their vision improves over time. There are a lot of um, common causes of CVI, and they typically involve those neurological um, disabilities or, or any kind of neurological events. So um, a stroke or trauma, a chromosomal disorder, asphyxia, any kind of hemorrhage. Um, so periventricular leukomalacia, congenital brain malformations, um, an infection, so something like meningitis, but a lot of students, a lot of our students who have multiple disabilities uh, may also have CVI. So it can be associated with um, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, microcephaly, hydrocephalus, things like that. Um, really any kind of brain injury or, or um, condition that can cause brain injury can lead to CVI. And in order to diagnose a, a child with CVI, they have to have a normal eye exam that does not indicate an ocular impairment that could be the cause of the lack of vision. So we know, well, we may know that a lot of our kids with CVI have things like nystagmus or strabismus or things like that, um, but that wouldn't explain their, their inability to use their functional vision. So we're really looking for an eye exam that doesn't explain why they're not seeing, why they're not using their vision. And again, that neurological condition that can be associated with CVI and the presence of the CVI characteristics. So in order to be considered a, a person with CVI, you have to have all three of those things. And so here are the characteristics right here. Um, and we'll go through and kind of talk a little bit about each one of them. But the important thing to remember is that they don't present the same in all children. So um, what, what may be true of one child with CVI who is in phase one may not be true of another child with CVI who's in phase one. So these characteristics are present at some level in students with CVI, but for some students they may be resolved or they may look different. And so the first uh, CVI characteristic is color. So children with CVI or people with CVI often have a preference for certain colors and it's most often red or yellow, but it can really be any color. So I had a student last year and um, the, the anchor color was purple. Um, so we outlined everything in purple. You know, we would um, put purple tape on the doorways and this student was able to navigate her environment because purple was her anchor color. And so once you recognize what a child's um, color preference is, you can use it across your instruction throughout the school day. And um, it's important to recognize also that the color can change. So what might work one year may not work the next year, but most commonly red and yellow are those, those color preferences for students with CVI. And so they can really help you to, to draw their attention to materials and also to help them to visually recognize and understand what they're seeing. Um, the next characteristic is movement. And so this is far more common in, with students who are in phase one and the earlier phases of CVI, but, um, it's definitely something that a child with CVI will most often always look at something if, if it's moving. So that movement helps to direct their visual attention. Um, and it can be, doesn't have to necessarily be something that's moving, but something that's pre that our brain would perceive as moving. So like a shiny glittery object um, that looks like it's moving is it, 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 it attracts children with CVI. So um, often when you have students who are just starting to use their vision. That's why we pull out a lot of those like shiny pom-poms, um, mylar balloons, things like that. But even as students 
um, go, you know, go, they progress throughout the phases of CVI, you will still have students who are considered to be resolving their CVI characteristics, but who still love to use that silver mixing bowl to drop things in. Um, and it really is that, that movement and the, the way that their brain perceives it. Um, the next characteristic is latency. And so this is really that delayed visual response. So you present something and it takes time for the child to, to look and respond to it. And that's just, that's just important for us to know because then we need to recognize that our students with CVI will probably require additional wait time. And so it's about learning that student and how long they, they need. Um, so the, the next characteristic is the visual fields. And so children with CVI often have visual field preferences. So instead of putting something right in front of their face, um, they, they may not see it there. It might be a lot of students, it's to the right and up. Um, and it's important to see your student's visual field and to know what it is, because sometimes if you present things outside of their visual field, there's no way for them to visually recognize it. And so one thing that is often done is that students are provided with slam boards because their lower visual field, they, they're not able to see what's being presented in, in it. So when we're teaching our kids, we always wanna make sure that we're providing them with visual access and recognizing where their visual field preferences are. Um, so complexity, this is probably one of the CVI characteristics that doesn't ever fully resolve. Um, and it's, it's kind of multifaceted because we start with, you know, the object surface, the viewing array, the environment and faces, all of those things can be really complex. Um, so like the, this picture on the left, um, it's from a parent of a child with CVI and, um, what she said was, I should have brought my own tablecloth because there's this tablecloth with all these different multicolored balloons and a green cake on top of it. And so that, that is far too complex, even for a child who's in phase three, to really be able to look at it and see and recognize that that's a birthday cake. So we, we always want to be thinking about how much we're providing for our students to visually process. Um, and what are we asking them to do? Like, what is, what's the purpose of what we're doing? Because if we want this student to be able to see that here's his birthday cake, he's turning eight years old, we wanna put something that he'll be able to see only that birthday cake. And then, you know, the same, the, the same with the picture on the right. Um, this is really a, like an excessively cluttered viewing array and environment. Um, there's so many things on these shelves that a child with CVI may not be able to discriminate between one toy and another, which is not to say, I mean, Classrooms in general are, they have a lot of sensory stimulation. There are a lot of different factors, a lot of things. Um, so when you're, when you have a student with CVI in the classroom, you always want to be, rec you want to recognize the fact that there, there are certain pieces of the environment that we can control. So while we may not be able to control the fact that these toys are on the shelf, maybe that student has their own space where there are fewer toys and there's less visual complexity because that's, that's what's really important is that our students are able to um, function in their environment. And then faces are something that students with CVI, most of them struggle with it for their, for the, for their entire life. It's really difficult for a student with CVI to, um, to, to look at an unfamiliar face and, rec and, and um, take in those pieces. And that's really because students with CVI, they process whole they, they look at the whole thing instead of looking at individual parts. And so, um, for instance, like parents, most students with CVI typically are able to recognize their parents and their close family members, um, but it takes them quite a long time to learn the faces of new people. And sometimes they're depending on hearing your voice or um, hearing your footsteps, you know, if, if people have like a heavy step or something like that. But this complexity piece is really something that, um, doesn't fully resolve and, and can really impact students academically throughout their career. So this can include um, doing worksheets in a classroom. You know, teachers are always trying to save paper, so they put as many things on the worksheet as they can. And for a child with CBI, that can make things really complex. Um, the next characteristic is light gazing. And this does tend to resolve itself as students progress through the phases of CBI. 
but um, a lot of students with CVI can, can spend a long time staring at lights or um, what's called non-purposeful gazing. So they'll just kind of look around, but they won't attend to a visual target. Um, so we can use this to our advantage, of course, um, if we're using a light box or something like that, you know, students will look towards the light, but it can be really difficult in a classroom setting because we do have those bright fluorescent lights and our kids with CVI love to just stare at them because they're, you know, they're, they're very um, visually appealing. So this does resolve, but even with my students who are, you know, have scored like a nine or even higher than that on the CVI range, when they're very tired or fatigued or if they've had a seizure, often they'll kind of go back to some of those characteristics, which can include light gazing. And distance viewing is another, another characteristic of CVI. Most students with CVI, they, they appear to be very nearsighted. Um, the students in phase one often require things to be presented closer to their face, as close as like eight to 10 inches from their face to be able to see it. And they might put things really close to their eyes so that they, they can see them. Um, so for instance, like if you give a student a toy, they might pull that toy really, really close to their face so that they can see it because distance viewing is something that they struggle with. But as they start to learn to use their vision, um, it does start to resolve itself and they can see things from, you know, a foot away. And students in phase three might be able to see things from up to two, or two feet away or more. But distance viewing from like their, a student's seat to the board in the front of the classroom is something that will probably um, be very difficult. So that's where you can use a CCTV or a, another magnification device to help. And um, I just like this picture of the little girl in the right corner because you can see she's leaning really close to try it and see what's on the, the screen. So the next characteristic of CVI um, are those visual reflexes. So some children with CVI may not blink when you touch between their eyebrows. Um, they may not have a, a blink response, but often this can be improved over time. And it's, it's, it's a, a, a characteristic to be aware of, but it's not necessarily a characteristic that is um, very like critical. It's not necessarily a critical characteristic for us to be working on when we're working with students in the classroom, but it's just something for us to be aware of. And so novelty. So novelty is, is a really difficult thing for our students with CVI. Um, they kind of get used to the way that, the way that things are, the things that they see, and then they have trouble attending to new visual targets. Um, so they're always, they, they would much rather look at something that they've seen before. They'd much rather play with a toy that they know. Um, and so this picture is from a parent of a child with CVI and they had just moved. And um, the parent was, <laughs> that all of their things were in boxes. And the, the child was saying, you know, well, where's all of our stuff? And the parent said, well, it's, it's, you know, here it's in these boxes. And the child just had so much difficulty understanding where their things were because the, his understanding of their, their clothes and all of their toys and all of their things was not of them being in boxes. And so even, you know, even something like moving can really help us to remember characteristics of CVI. And so one way that I see this a lot in classrooms is when, people, when teachers move desks and move the classroom around. Um, and that's difficult for most of our blind students because then they have to kind of relearn how to navigate the classroom. But especially for our students with CVI because if something isn't exactly where they've seen it before in the way that they've seen it, to them it, seem, it, it may seem as though those things have disappeared. And so visual novelty is really difficult. Um, and of course we want our students to look at new things. So we do have to work through that. Um, but one way to do that is to help them preview things and, and talk to them about things and give them those visual descriptions so that they can have a deeper understanding. But just knowing that, you know, showing a child with CVI something new is, can be difficult. And so visual motor. So this is a characteristic of CVI that um, is, is very noticeable often with students in phase one. And so what, it stems from the fact that um, the, the dorsal and ventral systems within the brain are not fully integrated. 
So the dorsal system is, is kind of that where system and the ventral system is that what system. Um, and in our brains, we're able to, we're able to, to do all of these things at once because our, our where and what systems are integrated and they communicate with each other. But what happens with our students with CBI is um, they, you, provide, you present something to them and they might look at it, look away, and then reach for it. And so that um, look and, and reach is really difficult. And it does tend to resolve itself as students learn to use their vision. But it's one of those characteristics that if, you're, if you see it um, you know, in a classroom, you may want to ask yourself if that student has CBI. Okay, so um, I also really wanted to take some time to talk about the phases of CBI um, because they're, so these come from Dr. Roman Lancy who kind of pioneered a lot of the current research that we have. And so um, knowing what phase of CBI your student is in can be really important because that can help you to know what accommodations they may need. Um, so students who are in phase one, these are students who are just building their visual behaviors. So you're just trying to get them to use their vision by looking. And for a lot of my students, um, these are the students who appear, you know, almost totally blind who maybe respond to light and dark, but don't have a lot of visual responses to other things. Um, for some of my students, even color was not something that they responded to. When students are in phase two, they start to integrate vision with function. So they start to recognize that their vision has a purpose, um, but they're not necessarily using their vision for that purpose. And so this is kind of where we're making adaptations to materials and helping them to understand how to use their vision purposefully. And then in phase three, this is called like the resolving CBI characteristics phase. But it is important to know that um, most students, even in phase three, they, while they may be considered resolving, they still require those accommodations. They still need, you know, they need you to recognize the importance of having a, a simple visual field um, and all of those things. So just kind of keeping in mind, thinking about where your student might be um, on the CVI range and kind of looking at what the, how those characteristics might manifest. So in phase one, um, like I said, students are just starting to use their vision. So everything is aimed at helping them start to use their vision. And um, one of the things that I think is really important is that we don't forget these students. Um, a lot of times what I see is that if a student's in phase one, we give them less vision hours because the, you know, they're not learning braille. Um, typically, they're not learning braille. And so that's the, the, the priority becomes students who are getting braille instruction and that, that um, academic instruction. But it's just as important that someone who understands CVI is coming in and encouraging that student to use their vision because that's how they, that's how they progress from each phase. So um, just kind of uh, developmentally aging isn't going to help them to, to learn to use their vision. They have to practice and they really have to, um, they have to be taught. So some things that you can do for your students in phase one are to use those high contrast and simplified visual targets and real objects. So this is an all in one board and it has a little plush Elmo and he has a yellow balloon with a red string. Um, so Elmo is, is typically a go to because he's red for our, for our kids with CBI. Um, and it's, and you know, it can be really any kind of object that's motivating for the child. Um, I had a student who anchor color was blue, and so we used the Cookie Monster for everything. Um, but really, it can be anything that's that's motivating to the child, and just thinking about something that's high contrast. So, if it's red or yellow, you want that black background. Um, you know, for students who have less common um, anchor colors, you kind of have to play it by ear and see what brings out the the color more. Um, but, you know, you could always also use a white background to try to bring out the, the contrast. Um, most students in phase one cannot see in their lower visual field. So this is important for us to remember because if you have a student who um, is in a wheelchair and you put something on their wheelchair tray, most likely they can't see it. So most commonly I would see a teacher put 
a, like a single cell switch, like a jelly beamer switch or something like that on the tray. So the child would move their hand to activate the switch. But the thing is that um, that child may not see that switch there. So that's when you have to look at using other cues. So you might use a tactile cue or you might use um, hand under hand to show them that it's there or just something so that they know, oh, okay, there's a switch here and you want me to hit the switch so that I can have whatever this feedback is. Um, but just putting something on a child with CVI's tray or on the table in front of them, um, most, most students in phase one cannot see in their lower visual field. And then um, we wanna really reduce those auditory distractions. So we, uh, for instance, like playing music in the classroom while um, having a student do some sort of task and then having other people talking, that's really disruptive and distracting. So we wanna try to make it as quiet as we can when we're working with students in phase one because the, all this work is really focused on getting them to use their vision. Um, the use of flashlights is really important. So it's recommended that you use uh, something that's at least 300 lumens, but if you can't find that, um, you know, just an LED flashlight that you can really use to target the, whatever the material is, is really important. And so I put a picture here of the, um, the Larry light, it's a flashlight, and it's really great for illuminating specific targets that you want students to look at. Uh, but there are so many other, you know, lights provided by APH that, that, are, that you can use, the Levo light or something like that. But just thinking about how can we provide additional light on whatever we want the student to look at. And a Philips light aid is also a really good tool because it can be used to attract visual attention. So even students who are really quite low on the CVI range, they're, they will often respond when you use a light aid. Um, but they're really expensive. So I, um, most school districts don't have a lot of light aids just hanging around. But if you have access to one and you have a student who isn't visually responding, that might be something that you would consider trying. And then if we go to phase two, um, so these students, you know, they're starting to use their vision more consistently, but it might lack purpose or efficiency. So this is where we really start to talk about salient features. Um, and salient features are really, really hard because they're also quite subjective. Um, so what I might think is a salient feature, you may not see as a salient feature. And then, you know, if we're both teaching the student, we really need to be on the same page because the idea is that um, if you're teaching about a banana while you're teaching about it, you're gonna remind the students about salient features. You know, use, use simple language, but descriptively tell them what it is and use color to highlight the salient features of the objects. So here in this picture, you can see that the body of the banana is outlined in red. Um, and so the cool thing is that the CVI Collaborative just created a salient feature dictionary. So um, this is really helpful if you're working on a team. So for instance, I was on a team this year um, and there were 20 people, you know, because once you consider all the related service providers, um, interveners, other people on the team, they can get quite large. So something like a salient feature dictionary can be really helpful because it's all, it's, it's, you know, a suggestion for what the common salient features of an object are. And I included the link here um, if you'd like to check it out, but it doesn't have everything in there, but it has most common objects. And I think that's important because if you're, if you're using salient features to teach about a, a concept or a thing, everyone needs to be talking about the same salient features. So it's not gonna work if we're talking about a banana and you're talking about the stem and I'm talking about the body. We all need to really be on the same page. Um, so definitely check out the salient features dictionary. It's, it's very useful and it can be quite helpful. Um, so again, you know, in phase two, we wanna avoid workspaces with a lot of visual clutter and try to eliminate glare. So there's this great thing um, called matte laminating paper, right? Because a lot of times um, what people will say is, you know, most of our students with CVI have some other concomitant disabilities. And so they'll say, well, you know, there's drool that gets on it or they crumple it up um, and, or, you know, things like that. And, and I did all this hard work. So matte laminating paper is something that you can use that avoids the glare. So if you look at this picture, um, it has, you know, the, the sign language sign for more with yellow hands and then 
golden glitter on top of the hands. And um, it's laminated with regular laminate, so it's, you can see the glare when you look at it. But with matte laminating paper, it, it stops that glare from happening. And it can be really beneficial for our students with CVI who have difficulty seeing when there's glare. So then when we get to phase three, like I said, this is when, you know, students are demonstrating some typical visual behaviors, but they might still require accommodations. Um, we want to think about avoiding visual clutter. That's, that's still going to be something that's quite difficult. So this is a schedule for a student. Um, and you can see that everything is really spaced out. Um, it's on a, it's on a trifold board from APH. And so there's two schedule pieces on each, on each part of the trifold. It's enough that the student is able to isolate the individual pieces. And these are pieces that were already familiar to that student. So um, there, you know, the student was able to recognize, oh, okay, we're going to start with saying hello, pull it off of the board and things like that. But visual clutter is really something that um, as, as a teacher for a student in phase three of CVI that you're always going to, to struggle with and that you will have to accommodate for. Um, and the interesting thing is that when students get into phase three, a lot of times they say the school district or, you know, um, people working with the student will say, well, well, they, they don't really need us anymore because, you know, their, their CVI is resolving and they're able to do all these things in the classroom. But what we have to remember is that if we take those accommodations away, that child is not going to be able to function in that environment. So just always keeping in mind that CVI isn't something that disappears. It's just that students learn to use their functional vision in a more effective manner. Um, the other thing that can be really helpful is again, that color to highlight salient features, but also outlining letters and numbers um, and helping students to kind of see the shape of the word. So one of the, one of the really common things to do um, when you're teaching a student with CVI literacy is to outline the words in red so that they can kind of recognize the whole shape of the word. And um, I would say most often I've seen this done with students who are not Braille learners. But of course, if, if a student is a Braille learner, um, this could definitely be used. But it's just that I've seen it most often with students who, who are um, learning through print. And so the, the red outline helps them to recognize the shape of the word and then they're able to associate the salient features of that word with the word. Um, it does take a long time because learning words by a shape is, is quite difficult, um, but it can be really, really helpful for our students. And then, um, so these pictures are just, one of them is of an experience book for a student about eating. Um, and then here's some of the words from the book. Also, when you have uh, students in phase three, one of the things that you want to think about are um, using those additional cues for distance viewing. So seeing far away is going to be difficult for our kids with CBI. So we want to think about how we can help them and what we can do. Um, so sometimes those cues might be tactile cues or it could be movement. Um, one of my students has um, the homework board is outlined in red tape. So the student knows, okay, I need to now, you know, I need to point my CCTV at the home at the red tape so that I can write down my homework. And so um, remembering that those those CVI characteristics, while they might be resolved, the student can still kind of fall back on them if they need to is, is something that can help your students in the general education classroom. Um, so in terms of like instructional strategies. Um, Calendar systems are really important for our kids with CVI, even our students who have multiple and severe disabilities. Um, on the left here, this is a tactile calendar system for one of my students who is deaf blind. And it's, it's really important because it helps them to anticipate what's happening, but it also, it also helps to provide a sense of routine to their day. So um, I would highly recommend that all of your students with CVI have some kind of schedule or calendar system um, and, and Boardmaker does have the contrasting color picture symbols, um, but some of them are very difficult to see. So it might be like a neon green with a yellow 
on the colors. And also some of them are too complex for our kids who are in the beginning phases of CVI. So you can always use objects. Um, that's something that I typically will start with my students if I'm teaching them something. I start with the object, um, the closest thing I can get to, to the real thing. So um, sometimes you have to really think outside of the box because um, there may not, you may not be able to get the real thing for every single piece of what you're doing. But as you kind of progress through, you can start with that object and then you might be able to move it to like half of an object. So maybe if you're talking about meal time, then you have um, the cup or the bowl or whatever, but then you move it to, you cut the cup in half or like a miniature version of the cup. And then maybe you have a picture of their cup that you, you know, you introduce. Um, and then you, you can later generalize that to like cartoon images of a cup, um, you know, but it's really a, a progression. And then for a lot of my students in phase one, like I said, um, we wanna work on building, the, building those visual behaviors so the picture on the right is um, we called it a, we called it a CVI cave, which is basically we took a box and painted the inside of it black. And this was for one of my students who needed to be positioned um, for 30 minutes and she had to lay on her side. So we would lay her on her side and then we had all these lights and and um, you know, mylar and glittery colored things inside that she could look at and we would try to help her to develop her visual attention. The other thing about it was that we could take things out um, and we eventually, you know, we put a bell inside and this was a student who didn't use her hands, um, but we found that when she was laying on her side inside of the CPI cave, she could reach up her left hand enough to ring a bell. And so that was really very exciting for her and something that she enjoyed. So, um, you know, just thinking about instruction and, and what does it mean because for some students with CVI, obviously that wouldn't be meaningful instruction, but for some of our kids who are in phase one, it's really meaningful and it's really important for them to learn to use their vision. Um, Any time can, can be instruction for our kids to learn how to use their vision. So meal time, um, one of my favorite things to, to use is the light up spoon or the light up fork. And so I, I put a picture of one here, but it could, really could be any spoon or fork that, that you can find that lights up, or if it has like a clear handle that you can put a light inside of it. I've done that before as well. Um, and, you know, it helps our kids to build independent skills. They're able to self feed and they're able to kind of help to um, develop mentally progress. But it's also very visually appealing to a lot of our students to look at, to look at the lights. And so what I would typically do would be to turn off the lights in the classroom and provide, give the student their utensil that they're using and then, um, you know, help them to learn to eat independently. But if you have a student who doesn't need those, those skills, even something like recycling um, can be, you can use it in, in school and provide CVI accommodations. So here, you know, they've outlined the paper and the cans um, opening in red. So that kind of helps our students to see, oh, okay, you know, obviously you'd have to teach kind of the salient features of which one is which, but for schools where students might have jobs, this is something that you could easily do. And then that student's job might be, you know, to recycle the paper or recycle the cans. Um, thinking when thinking about teaching kids, we really want to think about what are we trying to teach them? So what is, what is our focus? Um, this picture is of a picture graph. So we were talking about graphing, but it didn't really matter if the student saw the picture of the cars and the buses or whatever we were graphing. It really mattered that they understood the concept of creating a graph. So what we did was we used um, like soft red velvet paper um, from, the, from the carousel of textures kit and then the yellow corrugated cardboard. And so the student was able to put their pictures on and recognize, oh, okay, you know, I have three here and two here. And then they can still go back and feel those pictures later and be able to count and answer questions about their graph. So whenever you create an activity, you know, it's really important to think like, what is, what is the point? What's the purpose? And that can really guide the modifications and the, the strategies that you use. 
and then of course adapted books. Um, so I adapt, but I've adapted books for almost all of my students. Um, and it really depends on what their level of vision is. But even for one of my students who is in phase one, um, we adapted the entire first Harry Potter book for her and she loved it. And, um, it was, it was really great to see because it just so happened that her brother was also reading Harry Potter in his class. And so, you know, they would go home and, and mom was able to talk about it and engage with the brother and the sister about what they had read and what their thoughts were. So obviously there are a lot more instructional strategies that you can use, but um, just thinking about what your student needs and how you can help them to access the curriculum by just recognizing the point, like what's the purpose and what do they need to know and then how can you help to get them there. And so the kind of the last big piece that um, to talk about is what accommodations and modifications should you provide for your students with CBI? What should you list in the IEP? Um, and kind of what should you be doing to help them? So for most of my kids in phase three, I recommend a bold colored marker for writing. Um, this, is, this is really good. I mean, even for our students who don't have CBI who have visual impairments because then they're able to look back and see it. Um, something that we use often is, is simplified pictures or the use of real objects to introduce new concepts. So some of my students have an accommodation for, um, you know, the real objects for the first three times that they're introduced to a concept. That's obviously very specific, but um, I think when you figure out a way of how you're introducing something to your student, it's important to stick with it. And so frequent breaks for visual fatigue. With your students with CBI, you always want to be thinking about something that could be impacting how they're using their vision. Um, so seizures or medications or anything like that, are, they can all impact the, a student's ability to use their vision. And then a CCTV or magnification device as appropriate. And most of my students who are fully included in the general education curriculum, they do have access to a CCTV. Um, and you know they may have help from someone else within the classroom, like a paraprofessional, but they do have a CCTV to help them access what's on the board. Often, I will also highlight worksheets or materials for them. So for instance, something like, um, like a sheet of math problems. It's really hard for a student to know where they should write their answer and what they should be looking at. So just highlighting where they should write the answer can really help them to avoid confusion and help them to be able to more effectively complete the task. Um, but really you wanna be thinking about, if you know that something is, is too cluttered and they're not going to be able to see it, then you wanna be thinking about modifying the whole worksheet or whatever the, whatever the material is. Um, and then the use of an iPad for backlighting materials. Since the iPad has come out, I feel like it has been so helpful for our students with CVI because we can use the light from the iPad to really help our kids to learn new things. So if I'm teaching a student a new concept or vocabulary and they have access to an iPad, often when I move to from objects to pictures, I'll start with pictures on the iPad and show them those backlit pictures of whatever the thing is, like if I'm teaching about eating, of their cup, because it's, that light can be really powerful. And again, you know, the use of a slant board we really have to think about what our students can see and where their visual field is. Um, and especially if they have other orthopedic needs or anything like that, um, a slant board can only help them. So I would highly recommend, you know, for any of your students who are writing that they have access to a slant board. Um, and then preferred seating. So we want our students to be able to see and access content. So some of my kids have um, an accommodation for preferred seating but they might have preferred seating near the board for group instruction and then away from the windows for like science lab or something like that. So this really differs for every student because if you have a student who, if they're facing the windows, they're just gonna stare out at the sun all day, then you're really gonna to wanna to think about where they should sit. And then materials presented within a specific distance. So this is really dependent on what phase the student is, is working in. Um, but you know, our students in phase one can't see something from two and a half feet away. So if I have a student in phase one, I'll typically write an accommodation that um, all materials will be presented within 10 to 12 inches. 
So that way we know it's close to them and they'll be able to see it. Um, the next accommodation is previewing of materials. So um, this one was kind of new to me with one of my students that I had last year, but um, I found that it was really helpful to kind of talk to the student and go through what we were going to be doing the next week. So that way she could have an idea before we, before we started. So you might want to write an accommodation for, you know, being able to preview the materials before the instruction begins and it helps them to be processing and thinking about it as well. And then, um, of course, this is an exhaustive list, but the last one is controlled lighting. Um, you know, like I said, those fluorescent lights are really hard for students with CVI to not want to look at, especially if they're tired or if they've had a seizure or, you know, if there's some kind of, they're getting sick or something else is going on. So you might just wanna think about, um, you know, light covers, which are very easy to get now, but um, using floor lamps or something like that to control the lighting in the classroom so that the student can access what's going on. And then um, the other thing that I kind of want to talk about when we're thinking about modifications are thinking about student needs. So when we're thinking about our students, um, most, most of the students with CVI who I've met have additional needs, you know, like um, occupational therapy needs or speech needs, or um, I typically teach kids who are deafblind, so they have hearing needs as well. So we really want to think about what we're giving them and what the, what the goal is. And then if we're making something really, really hard visually, then we don't want to make everything else really hard too. So if it's really hard visually, and then it's really hard because they have to listen, but then it's also hard because they have to use their motor abilities to put something somewhere. You know, we're creating a lot of really hard things on top of one another. So when you're modifying work for your kids, you know, you want to be thinking about what do I want them to do? So if you're, if you want them to use their vision, then you might want to say, okay, well, I just want them to look and I'll say to my students sometimes, um, you know, I just want you to look or just listen. So that way they, they understand that, you know, I'm recognizing that it's really hard for them to look and listen and touch and, and, you know, then use their communication device to tell me about it. Okay. Just listen to what I'm saying for now, you know? And so, um, there's a, you really could make a chart with all of your students needs, you know, and, and say, okay, so this is the activity we're doing. What are the parts that are hard? What are the things that, that are going to be difficult for them? And what are the things that are going to be super easy? So, you know, if I'm asking a student to just listen to something, they're not going to have to speak. So that's not going to be hard. They're not going to have to look that. So that won't be hard. And they're not going to have to touch anything or, or anything like that. So that won't be hard either. Um, so when you're thinking about modifications, you know, really keep that in mind. Like how, how many difficult tasks are you stacking on top of one another? And are you still staying with the purpose of what you want them to do? Or is this really just becoming 15 difficult things that they have to do at once to finish this one task? And then if anyone has any questions, um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about questions. There was a question in the chat box um, that they wanted more information about how you modified the Harry Potter book. Oh yeah, sure. So um, I have my references on the next slide, but then I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint so that I can like look back. So hold on. Let me just pause my sharing. Okay. And I'm also going to email the PowerPoint to all participants. Yes. Um, so everyone will have all the information. Um, so yes. Um, so when we modified the Harry Potter book, it was really a collaborative effort. Um, so the first thing we did was talk about kind of how did we want to modify it? This was for a seventh grader at the time. Um, so what did we, well, first you have to check with your state department of education and make sure that you're allowed to read the Harry Potter book. That was the step that I didn't know about. Um, but once you get past that step, uh, you know, you meet with other people on the team and talk about what are the important things I want this student to know? Um, so we really started with vocabulary and then also, you know, what the, so, I work in Virginia. So the, the standards of learning that we're working on, you know, characters, setting, um, things like that were really important. So we, we talked a lot about that. Um, you know, it's, it's really important for her 
this student, it's really important for her to understand the concept of setting. Okay, so let's talk about what those pieces are. So, the, so before you even start modifying the book, before you even open the book, I would really think about what are the vocabulary words you want the student to know and what are, how is this tied to what they're supposed to learn? And when you get to the actual book, um, there are a lot of really, really good online resources um, to create books. So I prefer to use Boardmaker. Um, I just like it. But you can um, definitely use something like Tar Heel Reader or um, the Cast Book Builder. It's just more difficult to change the background, whereas in Boardmaker, it's quite easy to just make a black background. And so what I would do is go through each chapter. And, I, and so, so this is a lot of front loading, I'll be honest with you. Um, I've done a lot of modifying books for older students and typically it's a ton of front loading to modify everything. And then you just kind of go through it and, you know, sometimes you make small changes, but um, so we had a black background and then I, we had our vocabulary words. So one of the vocabulary words, um, we were a core word school. So one of the vocabulary words was um, help. And then I think we had work. And then we also had some like fringe words because you know, you have to understand that Harry Potter is a wizard and that he does magic because otherwise, otherwise you're kind of not getting the concept of the book. So we really picked, we picked seven vocabulary words for the whole entire book, but something that we could use in most chapters, you know, we could mo for most often use that word help. We can most often use, um, we could use the word work, you know, when we're talking about what's going on. Um, so we would go through and then I would just put like a very simple thing on each on each page um, and each chapter might be like seven pages so that's that's the other thing that um, is really difficult and it was the most difficult thing for me when I became a teacher was understanding that you don't have to tell our students everything so I would pick the most important points from each chapter and put them each on a page and then I would look for um, this was a student who could work with pictures if they were very simple um, and there was no clutter. So, you know, we would look for some pictures and, and what we eventually ended up doing was using some of the still shots from the movie. Um, it's probably not like copyright, you know, but um, so we would use some of the still shots from the movie and put them in the book. And so it might say like, Harry Potter is a wizard. And I would take the picture of Harry Potter sitting with the sorting hat and outline the sorting hat in red and then take away the whole background because the background is, you know, always very complex and, and things like that. And so the student would be able to see. And then, you know, we had also like a sorting hat because we had a whole, when I was teaching, we had a whole day where everyone got sorted into a specific house and we talked about what the sorting hat was and things like that. So it really, it, it, we really built up on it um, and it did take a it took much longer I would say than reading Harry Potter book in you know with students who didn't have additional visual needs um, but the most important thing that I would say is to know your student and know what they're able to see um, and how they're able to interact with their environment and then also just thinking about you know the background um, you, it's now because we have technology, it's, it's pretty simple to take the background out of pictures. So, so that would be something that I would recommend. And don't be afraid to cut things out because um, our students don't need to know every single little detail if it's not going to help to contribute to the point of what they're trying to learn. I feel like you could do a whole workshop just on taking out backgrounds. <laughs> yes, um, it's it's really it's really hard sometimes to know like, okay, should I make this background white? Should I make it black? You know, should I leave it? Um, so if I'm staging pictures, which I sometimes will do when I'm making books. Um, so for our deafblind students, we make a lot of experience books, and so if I'm staging a picture, usually I'll stand the person in front of a white background or a black background, so I can just avoid the whole difficulty, um, but yes. Um, so we have Pamela Reed. She works with CVI and cognitively low functioning students. Um, we have Amanda. Um, she says she's from Texas, a vision teacher and works with students with CVI. 
Um, and she's a mom of a child with charge. Um, he has TBI and he's 13. Um, and so I think we've gone through everything. Unless anybody has an additional question, we will be sending out the PowerPoint to all participants. So don't worry if you missed something. Um, and like I said, I put the link for the TBI portal. You can check out our uh, professional developments. We actually have a follow-up to this webinar. Um, it's Cortical Visual Impairments Part 2, um, done by staff from um, Connections Beyond Sight and Sound. And I don't remember the exact date, but it's on the TBI portal if you follow, um, if you follow the link, and I'll be sending it out again. So um, thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thank you, Paige. That was super, super informative. Um, a great job presenting, and um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me, um, and we will send them over to Paige. Thanks, Paige. I included my email in the PowerPoint as well, so if people want to email me directly, that would be fine. Perfect. Thank you. All right.